we had people come visit this weekend and just like oh man we, we just like did not get very much sleep and so today i'm like i'm like dragon put on out of it yeah i'm actually okay energy wise but like Dude, my like my neck and shoulders are just like killing me. I think from like doing stuff all day and then coming home and like crashing and I probably didn't move at all while I was sleeping. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> I think I just like slept like this all night and woke up and got back at it again. So um, Heck yeah. yeah. Yeah, I did not want to get out of bed this morning. <laughs> yeah. Who wants to do um, that? <sighs> you still keep a pretty strict uh studio schedule. I do. I've changed it around a little bit. I've changed it around a lot, um, but it is still fairly strict. Right now, I'm working eleven thirty ish to seven ish every day, um, and then in the evenings, if I need extra time, I'll I'll take extra time. Um, but I've been trying to instead of getting up. Do you still do you get up early at all? Like to do? Yeah, stuff? I still get up fairly early. I, I started um for a long time. I was trying to figure out how to like, you know, obviously. Well, for the last I don't know chunk of time, last year or so, I've been trying to figure out how to have a better work life balance, and so my solution was sort of like, well, if I get up earlier and I start my day earlier then I'll be done earlier and sort of in the second part of the day I can do, can like go to the gym and take the dog for a walk and whatever. The problem is that I'm a night owl. Like a lot of creative people, like I just, I don't, I have a slow, I, I get started pretty slow. And so, you know, I start to ramp up later. And so I've been trying to figure out ways to like, manage that over the last year and it hasn't worked really well and so a few months ago i was like you know what because if i was by myself i would do it totally differently but you know i have a wife and so trying to like she wants me to be around in the evening so i was like you know what what if i what if i got up at like eight every day which is early but not super early but if i got up at eight and then i just had like a slow start um took the dog for a walk had a little breakfast and then went to the gym around like 9 30 or 10, worked out for a little bit, came back. Um, then I would have like a chunk of time at the beginning of the day where I could do all the stuff that I don't like. So just that's just important. That's important. Yeah, yeah. So it's like all the stuff that's important, but I don't really care that much about. It's like, well, I'll do that when I have less mem- like energy, anyways. Um, and then by the time I get to the studio, by the time I, you know, starting my day at like 11 30, I'm, I'm like, pretty pretty up and pretty ready to go so it works really well and then i just work like i make breakfast and lunch every day because annie works from home too so i make breakfast and lunch every day and then annie makes dinner and then we have it like at seven so i basically stop and eat immediately and i'm like done and if i need to extend my hours i can you know i have the rest of the evening but yeah um, but that's the exception you know yeah that's, exactly that's, it's, you try not to make that a habit because otherwise you know family life kind of takes it takes a nosedive yeah and honestly it's not even just family life it's also just my own personal like well-being you know i think the longer i've done this full time the more it's just like it kind of takes toll on you a little bit not not like painting takes a toll but painting like 70 hours a week takes a toll over the course of you know over the over the years and so i've started to figure out like oh man if i don't have if i don't cut myself off like I don't, that was I don't miming do very a, well. <laughs> miming a <laughs> no what your your arthritis and you got to hold the paintbrush and hold the your arm and <laughs> yeah I mean pre- I mean pretty much yeah <laughs> it's it's not good <laughs> yeah well, awesome <laughs> yeah. how do you splat then you kind of have to like throw your arm yeah something like that I don't even know I have to I guess I just. I'll build a machine. I'll engineer something. And then eventually I just won't paint at all. I just won't even be a part of it. Well, there, there'll be an AI version of you or robot version exactly. of you that you can program to do all the things that you would do. Yeah. You know, I need to just, uh, I need to just create a, create a program in the metaverse and I can just paint in the metaverse. 
And we all know Zuckerberg is listening thing. to this podcast. <laughs> oh, He's <yeah>. listening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we get an email after this. Uh, yep. NFT, Metaverse, artwork. No, friendship request for Mark. Yeah. What's, the, oh, what's his name? Tom from MySpace. Yeah, it's Tom from MySpace. <laughs> Tom, <laughs> my hero. I actually got on Facebook for the first time today in like, honestly, probably six months. Congrats, and I, I was on for, dude, I scrolled for like six seconds and I was like, yeah, I, 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 I've had enough. Yeah. And me, yeah, this, regret this decision. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, well, I actually got on to look at something on Facebook marketplace and I was like, Oh yeah, Facebook. And so I started scrolling and I was like, I, yeah. I don't know about you guys, but <laughs> the only people I'm Facebook friends with are like people I went to like middle school with. And then like my aunt, like it's nobody that I keep up with at all. And so I just started scrolling and, and I was just like, yeah, I don't, I don't well, know. Instagram is becoming are. that way. Cause my mom comments on just about everything. Dude, it is. <laughs> Instagram is becoming that way. It's super weird. Nate, yeah, it's, your mom. Com- yeah. Oh fuck. I got to just go on Instagram for Nate's mom's comments. <laughs> yeah. You got to find uh, it. I'll, I'll post stories every now and then. And she'll like, if there's profanity in it, she'll message me about it. <laughs> it's pretty funny. That's incredible. <laughs> For those of you who have stuck through this absurdly long intro, <laughs> uh, this is from this <laughs> podcast. Uh, Phil and I are talking with our first ever guest again, uh, Nate. Hey, Arnick. everybody. He is a painter from Austin, Texas. Um, last time we talked about his habits and uh, how he got started in the painting business. And we thought it'd be cool to do like a a checkup or like a come back around and see how it's going. And uh See if he's learned anything. And My he agreed. Advice. Holy no, crap. Dude. He said yes. He said yes. <laughs> My annual checkup. Yeah. <laughs> Mental <laughs> checkup. <laughs> he's also yeah, yeah, I got us in two episodes. We got to try to get lightning twice. So there we go. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> um, Y'all seen that key and peel skit with lightning in a bottle? No. Mm. There's these no. two dudes. They're just like stoned as hell. And uh, they're trying to come up with business ideas. And he's like, yo, you know, if we got, if we got to do this thing, it'd be like, you know, capturing lightning in a bottle. And Jordan Peele's like, I got that though. And he like pulls up the the mason jar. (laughs) It's got like crackling (laughs) lightning in it. (laughs) Those dudes are so funny. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to try and cough as much as I can away from the microphone. I finally saw the skit associated with the uh, gif where Jordan Peele's like sweating profusely. Oh, yeah, 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 I yeah. finally saw That's that. That's like one of the skit. first ones. Oh, That's my so God. Good, yeah. <laughs> Do you say bitch? Do you, you say it? <laughs> yeah. Um, hey, speaking of you, celebrities. Do you think of me when we're doing it? And she just starts. <laughs> yeah. Hey, speaking of celebrities and, and comedians, did you guys see the Oscars last night? I saw the right clip before it happened, and then my friend texted me, and I went and looked it up. And it was all Dude. over the place. <laughs> it is. We literally were like, we just turned it on right before it happened too, oh, really? and we were like, just like jaws on the floor. Because it, do the thing was like watching it live. It really felt like a bit, you know, like you mm-hmm. know, because when you saw the the clips afterwards, everyone's like, oh my god, this happened. But watching it live, it it just felt like one of like the stupid campy Oscar bits, and so it was like. He went up and he smacked up. And was like, oh, we th- I thought it was a stage punch. And then it just like cut out for like 15 seconds. And we were like, oh, was that real? And then when it came back on, he, Chris Rock was just like, he was like right in the middle of saying like, wow, it was a joke, dude. Chill out. And then he like moved on and we were like, oh my God. <laughs> What just happened? And then we found the clip, you know, the, the full clip online, and yeah. we were just like, oh, so oh you actually God. tuned in to watch the Oscars. Why? I we're pretty interested in film, but honestly, like anymore now, it just kind of gives me a jumping off point for movies to watch next year. <laughs> no, no, totally. Yeah. I like I like looking at the Oscar stuff just to see what's nominated and what wins. And it's like, oh, okay, there's just some stuff to, some movies to check out. We hadn't seen we haven't seen almost any of the yeah, nominees same. this year anyways. So we've seen No Way Home and we've seen Dune. Um, I just saw we it. We haven't. Dune we just got saw like, it. it won six of the 10 that it was yeah, nominated. It won a bunch. It was crazy. Yeah. Yeah. We haven't seen Coda. We haven't seen Belfast. We haven't seen Licorice Pizza. We haven't seen Nightmare I Alley. Belfast. We haven't I, seen... Nightmare Alley is really high on my list. 
Yeah, dude, I love Guillermo del Toro. We we've been wanting to watch it for a while. We just haven't had like we used What's to watch a lot of movies, film? but um, we I've lately watched about half of it. Very much. No, it's Nightmare not, Alley. Yeah, it's not bringing me in like he normally does. Yeah, well, I mean, the reviews like on it were not. As, I mean, Shape of Water is like a 99 or Rotten Tomatoes, something crazy. One best picture. And this one has like an 80 or something like that. So it's certainly not as it, good. But wasn't a big fan of Shape of Water. It was all right. Like, oh, dude, I loved it. It was so I, weird. So yeah, good. I, I appreciate one of his movies I have not it. seen yet. But as a whole, it's just kind of like. Eh. And the OG or- orphanage in Spanish that he did. Oh, yes. Oh, I haven't seen that. I oh, love you got him. Oh, you though. You gotta. That's his early stuff, like yeah. Orphanage, Chronos, and Pan's Labyrinth. Pan's, and there was like one more before it, but I, I yeah, I know. I'm I, trying to remember it too. He was for a while working on a Pinocchio project, which was really interesting, and then he left it. And I was very interested to see what he would do with Pinocchio, but he got picked up. By somebody else, or something. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Disney I, didn't come knocking to his door and say, "Stop." Yeah, well, no, can't Pinocchio, do it. Pinocchio is like there are a couple of properties like Sherlock Holmes and like King Arthur that like the studios don't own the rights to. Yeah, like Robin Hood, like Robin Hood's one of them too. Like stuff that's like mm. common enough. I don't know if Disney actually owns the rights to the story of Pinocchio. Mm. You never know. I'd, I'd have to check and see. Disney would be that. Greedy to do it too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, well, they, might, they might have had to buy the the novel rights when they made the original film and still. Yeah, because you can you rights. can buy the rights and block all the other studios out from from making it. So I know that. Mm. Where did but I we didn't we didn't give you a proper introduction, Nate. Mm. Yeah, I'm um, pissed. Oh, I, I thought I had. I noticed, and I've you been mad this whole he's time. Livid. I know because I I <laughs> want to get into the nitty gritty here um well nate Sharmack is a fine artist from austin texas uh his art pre- is fine or he is fine like is he the fine artist he is a fine or his, artist or his art fine fuck you nate he is a <laughs> fine the fine arts <laughs> fine arts <laughs> Nate himself is also a fine artist. He's also yes, he is also a fine artist. That's why he's on the show. But he's also he's a practitioner of the fine arts. There you go, practitioner of the fine arts. I think Phil's Let, just a homophobe. To me, <laughs> <laughs> Phil, that is one way over your head. <laughs> Am I gonna have to come up? Come up there through the <laughs> screen and slap you like Will Smith did? To oh, Chris yeah, you're gonna have to Will Smith them. <laughs> That's that's now an adjective. All right, there we go. Or a verb. I'm not coming. It's no longer Chris Brown. It's now Will Smith. It's now. Oh, Smith. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Phil, I'm your uh, I'm your Jada Pinkett Smith. What are you gonna do about it? <laughs> <laughs> Don't you fucking say my wife's name. <laughs> Don't you dare. <laughs> yeah, the eyes. The eyes just. Uh, there you go. Anyway, oh, man. <laughs> let's get so, back on on topic here. We were gonna um, be like, man, the first podcast was great. I don't know what they talked about the whole second podcast. It was just two hours of Phil yelling at Nate, other Nate, talking, um, yeah, I'm just <laughs> talking about being Jada, and then they ended it. They ended it halfway through because there was he's a beautiful woman. <laughs> It's funny because the guest after you is also named Nate, so this will be this will be a good time. All the Nates are, <laughs> are just congregating together on this podcast. Did We're going the, full the Nate one with Jet Li mm. and uh, Jason Statham, where there's like multiple universes and like if like as you kill off your other alternate self, like you get more powerful. Mm-mm. Does that make sense? No, okay, never mind. So Nate, <laughs> um, what has since we've last talked, um, I know you're exploring like combining abstract art and reality, and you've been pushing that a lot recently. Like, what mm-hmm. what does that like slide look like for you? Like, how do you continue to explore new ideas within that realm? 
Mm. Tough yeah. one right off the bat. No, no, it's a it's a good question. It's a good question that's sort of like I have to answer other questions that you didn't ask in order to sort of answer it. So um Just interview yourself, we'll watch. Well, yeah, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> uh yeah, I mean the last time we talked, um I've definitely been through a lot since then. Um, like a lot of fruits, fuzzy fruits with stickers on them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I think I like. I've been through a lot, so it, it's been really interesting. I've had around this time last year, I had my first real like big flagship successful show, um, which was really great. It was super, super, super successful. Here's, and opened a lot. Of, yeah, congrats. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and it opened a lot of doors for me, which is really cool. Um, and so co- basically coming out of that show, there was uh, a few thing, a few key things that happened. Um, the gallery that I had the show with, um, and I won't get into all the, the details of this because there's a lot, but excuse me. The gallery that I had a show with, um, I ended up leaving them and I ended up joining another gallery. Um, and the new gallery that I went joined is it was like a basically like a startup brand new gallery just getting started. And um the director who was at the previous gallery, Davis, she left to go start this new gallery. And so um when I heard that she was leaving, I was like, Well, I don't really want to be at Davis without her. And so I left and went with her to her new gallery. Um and then shortly after that, I got picked up by another gallery, um, a really a really, really awesome gallery um, called Laura Rathie Fine Art. And they're in Dallas and Houston. Um, then I started working with a designer in Chicago, um, or I guess a, a gallery in Chicago. Um, and so that all that happened really quick. And then, and then when I worked with, I started working with Laura Rathie, um, basically when I came in, they were like, you know, hey, we love your work. Super interested in what you're doing. I think that you'd, um, you'd be a really good addition to a roster because you're doing things that we don't really show. Um, but like, our our sort of clientele, our brand, our price point, all that sort of stuff. Like, if you want to if you want to join our gallery, you're essentially going to have to double your prices. And so I was like, okay. And so not a bad problem to have. <laughs> yeah, it's it's an interesting problem to have. <laughs> so so sort of in the course of a few months, um, I went from this like show that went really well, and to having like completely changing all of my relationships with my galleries. Um, now pricing myself out of all the clients that I had before. So now I've sort of said, okay, well, all the people who are buying my work at this price point, like I'm going to leave those clients behind and embrace sort of this, this like next tier. Um, and then I started working with like Davis was a small gallery that's like well established. Um, and I started working with uh, an art representative in Chicago a gallery in Dallas and Houston. That's very, very well established. And then a brand new gallery in Austin that wasn't really doing anything yet. And so I immediately went to this kind of, um, okay, I need to make more work. And I'm going to be, I don't have any of the clients I used to have. And um, I'm going to spend a lot less time, almost no time now with clients and actually selling my work. Um, So that sort of like, trend like rapid transition maybe kind of get into this weird I, I sort of went on this big circle where it was like oh man okay i have more opportunities now i have more people wanting work from me um and they're sort of telling me this and that about what they may or may not want and you know prior to then right like a lot of artists they have this it's like a proof of concept thing it's right it's like oh i have an idea that i might be able to be successful let me go try to see if I can figure out a way to make it work. Um, And so then the transition started to be like, oh, shoot, I can actually make this work. It's no longer like, let me try to strike gold. It's kind of like, well, okay, what do I like? What do I like to do? Am I happy with the work I'm making? And do I feel like the work I'm making is important? What do I want to do with that? Um, And so the last, really kind of the last year has been this like, you know, very sort of subtle, low stakes, existential crisis thing where I've been like, okay, what do I paint? And if I'm going to be working with a bunch of galleries now 
and things are going to like solidifying, like I'm sort of building a brand that's much stronger. What do I want that? What is that going to be? Because if I'm going to keep building on it, it's got to be stuff that I can, can sort of continue to excavate like for a while. Um, and I'm not talking to as many people and I don't really know the clients. Like I don't know any of them anymore. <clears throat> I just ship a painting off and then a couple months later I get a text that's like, you know, sold a piece, expect a $5,000 check. And so it's very weird. It's very disconnected. It's very weird. So I just spend a lot of time painting now. Um, I have a lot more freedom and freedom is not always like freeing. So it can be actually kind of daunting. And so, um, so this year has been this very sort of like, okay, well Back now that I have a lot of live type of deal. Yeah, exactly. Now that I have a lot of free space, what am I going to do with it? Let me go try a bunch of things. Um, maybe lean into some stuff that I think will be successful. And I was like, well, I went down this road for a little bit. I was like, oh, I think I could probably sell these, but like, gosh, I hate painting them. And it's like, okay, well, I shouldn't do that. And it's like, go over here, sort of whatever. And it, ironically, it kind of took me on a big loop back to sort of when I started painting and there was no pressure, right? It's like, well, no one expects anything of me. Like, no one cares. <laughs> uh, I was like, I right, kind of brought me back to some of the same things I was thinking a lot about then. Um, and it sort of affirmed some of that. And then it, it opened. It was a year of sort of allowing me to kind of like try a bunch of things and be like, yeah, you know what? I don't actually, I didn't think I liked those things. I kind of tried to convince myself that I might, and I don't like them. So I'm cool with that. I'm cool with that. Um, and so now I'm sort of, uh, I, I sort of come full circle. I learned a lot in all of that process. Um, and I'm like pretty firmly planted back in um, trying to combine. So now to answer your question, right? So now I'm pretty firmly planted in like, okay, how do I combine uh, realism um, and sort of describing something that exists um, with, with these ideas of, of something that's abstract or something that's like not really expressible through, uh, through, so through literal representation, right? Um, so where I've kind of, landed in in that process has been sort of uh, like okay how can i how can i build out sort of a texture and a tone and a, and an atmosphere both with color and material choices um that communicate a certain i idea or a certain um i hate to say the word mood because it sounds kind of weird but like a certain mood right it with a physical object um and then layer uh, realism on top of that, and I'm not I'm not really interested in like painting realistic for the sake of describing something realistically. I'm interested in painting realistic and then kind of pulling it apart and breaking it down and messing it up. and And there's this this process when you view that um, where it's like, well, some things are familiar and some things my like your literal you know your brain is like. Oh, I recognize that, right? Our brains are crazy. We can recognize so much, like so many things, right? If you were to put like a million great, you know, grains of uh, grains of rice, grains of rice on a table, and you know, put a fly somewhere on it, it would take you, you know, a tenth of a second to find the fly. And it's like there's one there's one deviant or variance and it's like you find it immediately like our brains are so in tune with that stuff and so uh, i'm very interested in kind of like having some things that your brain is like that's that thing and then a lot of that sort of that breaks apart um and is sort of interrupted and layered um and then maybe there's there's sort of other associations that get layered on top and maybe there's something like well what happens if you take something that's really realistic and then you scribble on it and when you scribble on it, that feels destructive and that feels childlike. So how do you combine those things, right? Like how do you sort of combine these, um, uh, these marks that have these like sort of intuitive connotations to them um, with something that's like describing a real object? I think layering those things together is, is very, very interesting. Um, before, I think I didn't understand what that meant so much. I kind of thought of it more in, in terms of like, um, well, I like abstract and I like realism. Maybe they could sort of play with each other. Um, and, and now after kind of a year of playing, exploring and asking myself, like, what do you even like to make? 
well, what the hell am I even doing? <laughs> um, it's kind of like, oh, you know what? I, I really, really like this kind of, um, uh, this, this, this sort of like the image I'm painting isn't, isn't sort of actually the, the piece itself, but it's more the context that the image lives in around the whole piece, like the abstract and the layers, the textures and the marks, like they all inform each other. Um, and so when you do look at something that's realistic, that's sort of tied up within that, um, the rest of the painting informs how you view that, like how, how that all works. So yeah, I'm super interested in it. Um, and I think it's something I'm going to continue to do for, for a long time. Um, because I wouldn't try everything else that I was maybe interested in. And I was like, ah, I don't really like that. So <laughs> I'm pretty like, I'm feeling pretty solid about like this. This is kind of what I really want to be doing. Trial um, and error. The, uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, basis of a lot of things in life. Um, well, I'm, I'm happy that you, you found your, your new goal or vision, but can you explain a little bit more about Mm -hmm. how, or how are you affected by not having so much contact with the client versus now you're getting, uh, commissioned by the, um, gallery itself and you don't really know the client but they trust your they they pretty much trust your judgment in an art and yeah. they they're gonna they're like so how how did that affect your art basically what i'm saying yeah well it's it's kind of a weird thing right like <clears throat> all right i'm gonna i'm gonna use music because i think it's a little bit easier to so like wrap your head around, think, think about it like music, right? So, so it's kind of like if I was a nobody musician, right? Yep. And I like to sing and I just want to make it. Um, what kind of album are you going to make if you're 16 and, and you have a dream of somebody noticing you? Like, well, in a lot of ways, like your taste and your decisions are informed by what you think will be successful, right? It's kind of like, let me try to sort of ride in the coattails of what, other people are doing that's not wrong that's a good thing right that's what you should do you should em, you know emulate your heroes and emulate culture um but what ends up happening is like a musician made a an album and then they blew up and then their re- labor you know the record label came to them and was like okay here's now this isn't my situation but this is hyperbolic but you know here's all the freedom in the world to sort of make whatever you want to make mm-hmm. um w- now what do you want to do it's kind of like well I've actually never been in a position to ask myself that question before. Right. It's kind of like, well, I made a country album because I thought a country album would be successful. And it was now it's like, Oh man, now I'm not grinding in my like bedroom trying to, you know, make music and sell mixtapes. You know, it's like, Oh shoot. I'm not in that position. So now what do I do? Do I like making country music? Like, is that something I want to perform 80, you know, 80 nights a year? And then, you know, is that, is that the world I want to immerse myself in? Right. And it's like, oh, shoot. No, I don't you know. Maybe, maybe you strike gold on the first try. Maybe you don't, I, you know, I don't really know. But I think that that question is sort of like, oh my gosh, what were my motivations in making that in the first place? Do I want to be known as the country music guy? Do I want to build a career on country music? Do I even like it? Right. So, so for me, it was sort of like I was making a lot of decisions on the front end. I wouldn't have, I don't think I really realized this until I got there, but I'm making a lot of decisions based on sort of like, well, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to come up with an idea that I think will be successful. And once I sort of found something that was a little bit successful, in my mind, I went, okay, now I need to try to find another idea that's more successful. And then it was sort of like, I did that. And I was like, wow, I don't really like doing this though. <laughs> like this hmm. thing now, now what I'm doing is like, why am I doing it? Am I just doing it because I think it's successful? So to answer your question about the clients, as in the beginning, I did everything myself. And so, you know, there's, if, if you let's pretend I work 40 hours a week, which is a lot more, but (laughs) let's pretend I work 40 hours a week. Right. So if I spent 25 of those hours a week 
doing client stuff, you know, trying to like get everything together, trying to like send emails or deliver an install or whatever, blah, 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 blah. The amount of sort of time and energy I have to worry about like, okay, well, you know, these big privileged questions of sort of like, do I like doing what I'm doing? Like it's, it's just not there as much. Um, and in some ways that's healthy. And so once things started changing and I get really removed from the business end of things, the business end ends up being like, I make whatever I want to make and I make a bunch of it and I ship it away. It's like, oh shoot, well, I don't have other things to put my energy into now. Now it's like, before it was like, hey, I'm lucky if I get 15 hours a week to paint. Now it's like, hey, if I want to paint for 80 hours this week, I can. And so it's like, oh, well, great. Now that I have all this time, it gives you a lot, a lot more space to kind of reflect and, and think about things and, um, and notice stuff that didn't really bother you before. It's like dating, right? The first couple of dates you go on, you spend two hours a week with somebody, you don't notice very much, you know. <laughs> then down the road, you move in with them, and you're like, "Oh man, you got a lot of crap, right?" Like, I don't, I don't know how I feel about this, right? Like, mm-hmm. you're not Phil, the person Phil is I literally in that were. position right now. I'm in that boat right now. <laughs> yeah, right. It's it's tough, right? It's sort of like, oh man, like all the stuff I saw in the beginning, it's still there, but I see so much more of you than I did back then. And, huh? How do I feel about that, right? Um, low doses is fine, but, but when it's, when it's your life, when it's your every day all the time, like you see things differently. And so I think for so me, this was, was a, of, generally speaking, this was a positive for you. Oh yeah. It's a with big your positive. art and your yeah. creativity and your, you know, energy to paint and create, this was a positive. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say it's a necessary evil, right? It's sort of like, you can't, I, I can't move forward in my I can't have a long sustainable healthy thriving career without going you know without figuring out things I don't want to do um, I, I mean honestly I think this that this year in a lot of ways was one way to look at it would be like I wasted a lot of time on a lot of things that didn't matter or a lot of things that I didn't actually like but the thing is that it's not a waste because you have to do that stuff, right? Like mm-hmm. you just, you have to, you, you mm-hmm. can't know what you want and you can't know who you are until you do that. And so right. um, now on the other side of that, I feel now, like last year, I didn't feel really soft. Well, I don't know what I'm going to do. Like, I know kind of, but I'm still figuring it out. Now I feel a lot more solid and like, Hey, I like this thing. I don't like those things. I'm going to, I'm going to do this. Right. Um, and that's super necessary because I'm not thinking about like, you know, the whole problem with this year was not like, man, what do I want to do tomorrow? It was like, what do I want to do 15 years from now? Like, oh, <laughs> right. Am I going to yeah, right, right. Right. It's sort of like, okay, well, if I start building a career on this, like I, I might be fine to tough it out for six months for a show, but I'm not toughing it out for six months for a show that I hope goes well anymore. It's like, I'm thinking, in 15 years, what do I want to be known for? In 15 years, what do I want to still be painting? Right. Um, and so that's been the big thing of like, okay, well, if it takes me a year to figure that out, who the hell cares? It's one year. You're so fast. Right. right? It's, yep. it's, it's a blink. So a year is not that fast, but, but in the grand scheme of a career, right. It's, it's no time. So it's not a waste. It's not frustrating. Like it, it is a little like, Hmm. Okay. Well, that was a weird year, but, you know, by the grace of God, I've I've been able to sustain that and still sell paintings, which is crazy. And we got a show coming up in May, um, and I'll be hopefully taking on some other some new galleries here soon. That I've been talking with, um, so things are going good, and, and that's crazy. And I'm I'm very very fortunate to have that. So um, it was not a waste of a year. It's just a weird year. <laughs> it was a weird like. <laughs> All right, I gotta figure. I gotta figure myself out a little bit this year, <laughs> um, but not a waste at all. Definitely, definitely great. Good to go through. Um, so, what is your? Has that changed your ideation process at all? Because now that you have more time to actually, like, I'm I'm in that boat right now. So I'm working on a series, and like, every yeah. now and then I'll, I'll 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 finish the thumbnail process you know, and I'll land on one. And I think I'm really in love with it. And then halfway through the finished piece, I'm like, I don't like this at all. So like, you you have more time now to spend on that. So what Mm -hmm. is your, what is your thought process look like now? And how has that changed from when you were, you know, doing 
a piece or two a week for clients. Well, I think when you're like, when you're a kid, right, you kind of have this idea when you're, when you're learning how to draw, there's this sort of obsession with like skill mastery, right? You're kind of like, number, number one, you're just a kid. So you're just doing it because you like it. Number two, it's like, you're not very good, <laughs> right? So you're like, you're not very good at drawing. So it's like, it's endless. You can just endlessly try to get better because you're not very good at it. Um, and then number three, it's sort of like the things that you choose to draw are, are totally arbitrary. There's just, there's no pressure and you just do it because you want to. And you can, there's a, there's a very, 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 very like far <laughs> distance between you and actually being good at drawing and painting and whatever. And so I think as, as like you get better, right. Which is what you're, you're experiencing. And I've experienced this too. As you get better, it's kind of like, Oh man, well, I'm not just like, endlessly trying to be able to hopefully paint an eye it's like well i can paint an eye now it's not as stimulating as it used to be um and so my experience with that has been it's been interesting when i was young i used to look at like abstract painters and i used to think like those people suck so much and and who could ever like that (laughs) like i don't understand it's just terrible and, and as I've gotten older and as I've gotten better, like I'm at a point now with drawing and painting where like, I'm just not, I'm not super satisfied with spending 70 hours like laboring to realistically paint something that I've already, like if I've already decided what it's going to look like, I, I can't do four weeks of just painting it. And so now I find that like I have to have some discovery along the way and I have to have this, this intuitive kind of like playfulness every day in the studio. If I don't, it ends up being like, well, I'm pretty good at drawing and I'm pretty good at coming up with ideas now. And so if I come up with an idea and I'm like, I'm going to paint this, cool. It's going to look cool. Cool. I'm going to paint it for the next four weeks and I'm not going to be that stimulated by the process because I've done it a billion times. It's just mm-hmm. kind of like, well... I don't have the stamina and the interest to do it. And so my, my coping has been like, okay, well, I can plan. Basically, I can plan some of it. I can plan sort of maybe the bones of it. And then I leave a lot to discover as I'm painting um, and as I'm drawing. Uh, and so I don't end up having this sort of like, here's my plan. Let me execute it for the next 130 hours and listen to, you know, TV show and be bored. It's kind of like, well, here's the bones. Here's a, like a broad brushstrokes plan. And, you know, every day, every moment, right? Like I'm, I'm making decisions and I'm trying to figure this out. And maybe it's not every moment, but it's like, well, I can, I can, you know, haul ass on one part of it for six hours and then start messing around and experimenting and doing like funny stuff. And so my experience has, has literally been that like, oh, I have to leave, I have to leave a lot of room for experimenting for the halfway mark. You know, if it's all planned out, then it's just like, I can't, you know, <laughs> I've already discovered too much. It's not, it's not fun anymore. <laughs> um, and so you do, all the fun, you do all the fun stuff at the beginning and now it's kind of just like, yeah, yeah. You <laughs> figure it all out. And then, Was that like, ever told to you at art school or by another artist? You need time what? to experiment. That's a, really, your work? that's a really great question. You know, the thing is, yes, but I didn't understand what it meant. I actually thought it was stupid. Um, because I'm, I'm one of those people who's of the mindset that sort of like, who is sort of like obsession with craft. Um, I'm, I'm like, I'm a technician at heart, right? I like mm-hmm. doing things like woodworking. I, my foundation is in like, you know, hyper realism drawing and painting. Like this sort of like obsessiveness with, with, you know, fun. Who has time for fun? Like there's a way to do it and let's get it done and let's be better. Right. And so I think when people would say things like, we well, need to enjoy the stu- like your time in the studio or you need to be playful or you need to like, um, things need to come from like a, an intuitive place. I'd be like, that's the stupid, that those are words of people who can't draw very well. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> like that's someone who's not very good making excuses for not being good. And now I realize like, no, that's actually like so true because, you know, this as a long-term lifestyle 
it can't be this like put your head down and grind all the time to just well it, uh, it can but for me that doesn't work like for some people that's that's exactly the way their brain is wired and Other Nate, do you agree I'm him if he's stuck with the keep your head down technician part. <laughs> yeah, what? that's why that's why I asked you. I'm, do you agree with that? Do you have fun in your studio when you're drawing? I have fun getting things technically right. Yeah, like if if something looks the way that I planned it, like if I do all my mapping out and something turns out the way that I see it in my head, that's a success for me. Yeah. I, I do a lot more pre-production, I think, than you. Mm. Do. Yeah, yeah, and that's and that's part of it too, because the way that I work, working from photographs, I don't have a lot of like, I'm not illustrating, right? So what you're doing is you're sitting down and you're drawing and you're sketching and you're trying to come up with something. You're trying to figure it out, like, dude, if I'm working from a photograph, it's just like, this is what I'm painting. This is it. <laughs> I found it. <laughs> Right, Google guy, guy with hair, found it. That's it. There's no, there's nothing else to to explore, right? And so it's it's totally different from your process, which is illustration. And then when you're illustrating something, and then you're like, well, I don't know what this is supposed to look like, so I have to figure that out. Um, there's a lot more space for you to kind of like play and toy and like it's like a it's kind of like a puzzle, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, um, but Nate, do you see it as that way, Nate Smith? Do you see it as that way? Yeah. That's like, I mean, that's, that's why I do it. It's yeah, like, cause it's creating, fun. it's like, it's like creating the still for a movie or mm. like a, a story beat. And you have to figure out the best way to tell that story. And then, I mean, the, the ink part is just like a technicality. Like I'm always looking yeah. for, I'm always looking for ways to make the line tell the story that I want it to. And that's mm-hmm. like slowing down has always been a huge struggle for me because like I'm halfway through a piece right now and I did the pencils for it last August and I've gotten so much better since then. And I don't know if I mm-hmm. want to spend another 40 hours inking something <laughs> that I can do better at. <laughs> yeah. So, so getting stuff Very correct good point. is getting stuff correct is what I get off on. Like that's, mm. yeah, I don't know trying to i trying to not use lines as filler yeah have the, having every like mark mean something and convey information rather than just like fill a space has been huge recently mm, that's so good i want to see less lines from you nate not gonna happen <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna wind up being like you're gonna wind up being like matisse and just doing like really little one line drawings yeah no eventually but, Eventually you'll get there. You know, just keep refining it and refining it and refining it. Just a single line across yeah. the page. You know, another, I love another it. Dog, dog with pain, leash. A pain in the ass is like a like tonal structure. And just like having the P's as a whole work tonally. Mm. It's been a big burden. <laughs> Do you mean tonally like like literally like your well, no, I n- never mind. I was gonna say, do you mean like color? But you don't mean color, obviously. Um, Nate is averse to color. I yeah. don't know why. <laughs> I'm, I'm very. I, I don't like. Color. I don't know why. Because figuring out how to tell things in black and white is much more fun. Okay. Okay. Um, if that's if that's your answer, that's your answer. Like uh, levels of gray, and having stuff separated from each other sheerly because of you know the neighboring tone being different rather than the human being able to recognize what it is yeah if that makes sense yeah totally so like if you saw dune like all of the contrast there you know telling you what information is going on rather than just you like that's a ship that's a person it's like no that's a black shape put up against a lighter black shape and you can tell what that is Right. But I would make the argument, though, that's the route you're going to go, that you can also do that with color. Oh, oh I know. my God. I, know. I just think it's more fun with color. Oh. 
Yeah. That was the will slap of the night. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 but no, no, because I know exactly what you're saying, right? But it's like if you get your values good, and I'm not saying I'm one of them, I'm still trying to figure this out, but good <laughs> painters, right? They do that with value and then they do that with color. Yeah. And so it's like, oh man, like they're not only do they use like what you're talking about, right? Not only do they use sort of like this. I think it's called blocking or like. Yeah, yeah. Right. This this sort of like intense color blocking and value blocking. And then they'll separate like, you know, put something red on on a blue background. And it's like all that also has so much like contrast and and sort of hue and chroma. So um, yeah. Anyways, black and white is great. We're just throwing that out there. You could. You could. You know, you could throw a little bit of color in there. Well, maybe just, just because I'm not good at doing it in black and white, and then I'll move on to color. <laughs> just one, just one color. <laughs> Let's start with one color, yeah. yellow. Nate's like, I don't do grayscale anymore. I do red scale. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's just a shade of red. It's like, oh, that's, it's the same thing. <laughs> I mean, I see people using colored inks and like the whole drawing is, you know, like a red yeah. or blue ink. Oh, dude, really yeah. Have you seen the people who do ball, like the blue ballpoint pen stuff? Yeah. Those people are crazy. Like to get that much shading and yeah, like that much variance with a ballpoint bin is absolutely mind blowing to me. Yeah. Um, that's stuff's so cool. But uh, yeah. Anyways, have you ever well, they have a lot of doing, time like, on their hands. Realistic like portraits. Yeah, I mean, like if you were, if, who who would you paint if you had the opportunity to? Like if someone oh. were to like if someone were to sit for you like in the traditional sense and like you were to paint them like, mm. I think some someone like um, first person that popped in my head was like William Defoe. That's that's someone, me too. <laughs> really, which yeah, is like a very someone expressive like a really, face. Yeah, yeah, like a really interesting face, right? Um, yeah, but but dude, honestly, like. Yeah, for me, and this is that's kind of a little loop actually. Back into what I was talking about, what we were talking about before, it's kind of like I'm just not. You don't, you don't super, want to paint them and then deconstruct it. <laughs> yeah, like I'm just not super interested in hyperrealism anymore. I used to like really pursue it hard, and now I think like sort of on the spectrum of like you know completely photorealistic to completely abstract not <laughs> like I, I, yeah to, to not whatever that means <laughs> you know i think that my threshold for being happy is somewhere around like 80 percent. and i think when i when i paint i'm sort of looking for like 80 percent. are the values right is the hue right to 80 you know to, to the 80th percentile and like i don't really do a lot of fine detail anymore um i like this sort of soft fuzzy kind of like well you get it you get all the information you need and nothing looks wrong but not all of it's there does that make sense it's yeah. kind of like um well, and also i like, also like the, that the 80 percent rule is also really good like uh truncate for perfectionism yeah because i've found that 100%. i can i can overwork and overwork and overwork something and it still doesn't look right because my skill is not there so like you kind of have to mm. give yourself a little bit of wiggle room to simply mm-hmm. get better, you know, like harder mistakes and then move on to the next thing. So there'll be times where I was like, this is as good as it's going to get with like where I'm yeah. at right now. Right. Like, <laughs> it's like, all right. Like, you know what? I don't I know anymore. From, like, <laughs> I went from hating it to like, it's passable and that's good. I'm moving on. Like, <laughs> I don't see anything that's really driving me crazy. And I'm like, I'm okay. I'm going to move on now. Cause you can, Dude, you can work on something, you know this, you can work on something forever. It'll never yeah. actually be done. And so you sort of have to, people ask me a lot, like, how do you decide something's done? It's like, I decide when something's done, when I Enough. don't look at it and think, oh my God, that part is so ugly. Like when I start, when I stop doing that, I'm like, yeah, all right, I'm going to move, I'm going to move on now. Um, and then, you know, two months later, I end up being like, oh, that's a good painting. <laughs> I can't believe I did that. That's actually pretty good. But, you know, it's like when you're making it, you sort of get to this point where you're like, okay, I don't see any more problems. I don't have any more fires to put out. Now let me move on to something else before I keep obsessing over this, before I find something, right? Yep. Uh, yep. I'd love yeah. to have a life where I don't have to constantly put out fires. That'd be nice. 
<laughs> That'd be nice. I know. <laughs> it's, it speaks to the human experience, right? It's just sort of like, if I could just sit down and when I put my pen on the paper, everything I want to happen just happens, that would be really, really cool. But that just doesn't seem to be the way life nope. works, right? No. Nope. <laughs> like it's like the scene in iRobot where Sonny just like puts the pen down and just like scribbles that massive I know. drawing of the bridge and just like, just hit play and he just... Yeah. Um, but I think, I, I honestly think though that like a lot of a lot of meaning and purpose comes from the, the, the sort of constant, like taking up responsibility and fixing problems and like, you know, all that stuff. Right. It's sort of like, if I just sit down and did the thing for my robot, that would, that would suck. That would just be so boring, you know? And so that, that process, both, you know, both in the studio, but also as a metaphor for life. Right. Like if there's no, Drama. No, that's not the right word. But if there's no sort of like, um, you, can, you can use drama as yeah. like, a, like a play, yeah, 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 uh, right? Exactly. Different acts. Right? Like if there's no drama, then, then it's like things are flat and they're boring and things feel purposeless, right? Like there is nothing more dull than, like more dull and more life draining than just like sitting on the couch and watching a show you've already watched for. 20 hours like it that sucks sometimes it's nice on a weekend when you've had a long week but i mean that as like a lifestyle right like yeah. that would be horrible if you just sat by if you just sat alone and watched something you've already seen on your couch forever like it would it, it would be horrible you know it, it sounds like, like a cia that. torture device <laughs> right yeah put on the like, same oh, episode of uh and like a uh, clockwork orange where they have friends like fried open like <laughs> right <laughs> yes <laughs> Yeah. Now to torture someone, which episode of Friends would you make them watch? Oh, I don't. I haven't oh. seen Friends. Any of them? Because <laughs> <laughs> by the time you've watched it for maybe the fifth time, you're going to scream and say, please, God, turn it off. Yeah. <laughs> I've watched a few episodes and didn't really like it. And the criticism I've heard from a lot of people is like, dude, if you just take the laugh track out, none of the jokes are actually funny. Which is a very interesting, interesting yep. way to talk about a show. I don't uh, like being told when to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> laugh we'll now. We can, <laughs> we can see if we can stir all the uh, Friends fans up on the internet and come yeah. after us. I'm currently on yeah. season eight. <laughs> nice, oh, Jesus. So, it, it it tapers off pretty hard, but yeah, I will say it aged better than how I met your mother. Mm. Oh, I did okay. just finish rewatching that, and it does hold up a lot better than that show does. Interesting. Well, well, we're getting that '90s was... show now, so let's see what happens. Are we really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good God. Yeah. Let's see if it, you know, lives up to the hype or uh, just crashes and burn. Didn't they have like a that's '80s show? They, they tried to do something, never, never and then never. I don't know. I don't know. I think they did. And mm. then it never, never took off. What's going to be weird is when they have a that's 2010s show and we're going to be like 60. <laughs> what? <laughs> like, how is that a throwback? What? I remember. I remember listening to Dance Gavin Dance and, uh, and Fall Out Boy every day. It was the prime of my life. I remember when the iPhone first came out. I was like, yeah. just yesterday. <laughs> Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh man, mm. not a huge DGD fan. <laughs> I tried. Really? Yeah, I tried. Oh, too I love wheedle- Dance Gavin Dance. Too wheedly wheely for me. Mm. Do you like Tillian on his own? Better you listen to solo stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, I listened to his one album with like the plane on the front. It was alright. Yeah, yeah. He, I think he likes his own voice too much. <laughs> it's all about <laughs> Kurt Travis. He's really good. But I feel like the vocals are a little like overemphasized. Mm. It's it's hard for me to put a finger on it. Yeah, that makes like, sense. Not like in love with it. Well, yeah, maybe and maybe it's just a genre thing. Like that genre doesn't tend to emphasize vocalists. Like, yeah, yeah. It's just like 
They, they do, but but only to a certain point. And Tillian's got some pipes on him, and it feels almost a little out of place for for the for that sort of world. Yep. Um, hmm, it's interesting. No, yeah, I like Tillian stuff. I like Dance Gavin Dance a lot. And they opened for Under Earth when we saw them a couple of years ago. It was really good. Yeah, oh, we saw great. Tillian. Yeah. yeah. I'd never heard of him before and Phil was freaking out about it. I'm like, oh, oh. I was. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I, I like Kurt Travis's time in DGD, mm. but that's just me. Yeah, I mean, I did. I do too. I like them both. They, they, they're they a little different and they're both Is that before Johnny? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, Johnny's a weird dude. <laughs> Does he have I'm, a MacBook for sale? I need one. I need a new one. Dude. Maybe I need to. Maybe I need to buy Johnny Craig's MacBook. <laughs> Why was he posting about yeah. his MacBook? Oh, mom, was it Facebook or MySpace? He did that. Uh, I think it was. It was fa- Facebook. I don't think it was long. I don't think it was long enough ago to be MySpace, but maybe it was. I don't know. Between Johnny Craig and. Um, uh God, what's the dude? Who's the dude from Escape the Fate? Ronnie Radke. Ronnie, Ra- Ronnie Radke. Between those two guys, oh my gosh, so much, so much drama there. Fringe. Not with each other, but just in general, they have enough drama, drama for the whole genre. <laughs> uh huh. Uh-huh. Not gonna lie, Falling in Reverse is new song, which is pretty dope. <laughs> Falling in Reverse is, is Nate. Are we friends? Are we friends, Nate? Listen to it. Listen to it. It's it's Fine. not half bad. <laughs> Fine. Fine. There. They've been hit or miss. I really liked their first album that they came out with. And I didn't really like... I really liked most of the first album they came out with. And I didn't really like anything, basically, they've done after that. But I haven't heard their new song. <laughs> yeah. Do you guys like Nothing More? Haven't I heard used, of them. I used to. I, I appreciate... I, I couldn't sit and listen to a whole album. Hmm. Okay. I, I'm I'm more of an album than a playlist person. And so like okay. I'm much more likely to gravitate towards someone where I can just like put a record on and not have to worry about it than Yeah, I, I got I get that. Yeah. It's like background music for me. If it's a playlist, I'm like, oh I haven't heard this one before. And then I like pause, you know, and listen to it. Which takes me out of whatever it is I'm doing. <laughs> mm. We're just sense. waiting for every time I die to get back together. In uh, never, yeah, no. never gonna happen. Really? Um, one of my one of my favorite albums front to back is. Um, do you guys know the band A Lot Like Birds? No, no. Oh no. man, dude, their album Davisi is like, oh, oh man, it's so good. It's hmm. they're they're a little more on the lighter side. They're they're maybe in a, like a similar tier to something like um, like uh, Pierce the Veil. Uh, they don't really sound like Pierce the Veil, but they're kind of that's kind of where they lie. Um, mm-hmm. dude, Davisi is just like, yeah, you guys gotta listen to it front to back. It is so freaking good. Um, and they broke up, which is really sad. So, we're not gonna get any more from them. That's what happens to good bands, they just break uh, up. I know, right? They just, break um, up. do you guys know the band Sandbar? Sandbar, Sandbar, how you say it, Sandbar, something like Sandbar? that. Sandbar, um. Some of the guys, some of the guys went to went and did Sign Bar, and then some of them also went and did. Um, they're in a band called Sufferer. Um, if you guys have heard of them, yeah. But I like words. To VC, great album, love it. Amazing. I'll listen to that on the way to the grocery store. Let's Rock go. On. Oh man, I think I think that's where my vinyl collecting started. Was because like while my phone was recording my drawing, I could put a record on and not have to worry about like, mm. you know skipping or you know i don't like this one or just even being able to do it because my phone's recording (laughs) yeah 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 it's really dope Mm. but nate now all these bands come out with double albums what are you gonna do oh fuck my life i hate it so much (laughs) gotta have to buy cds (laughs) i hate it like when an album comes out and i really like it but it's released on two vinyls because like just however the album was arranged they couldn't put it you know on an a and a b they had to split it up between four and it's just like I'm not flipping a record every three songs. It's just like not, <laughs> not practical. They're gonna make their way back to CDs. I I agree with Phil. I've already seen CDs are gonna like, come back in. Cassettes are already back. Yeah, yeah. yeah cassettes are already. Back. I love it. Mm. Phil's got his uh his collection here. 
<laughs> oh, yep. Yep, 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 yep. I only recognize Dang, that person. Let's go. I didn't see any of the covers, but I assume they're all Britney Spears. My Am I sad right? boys, my sad boys out there. American ah. football, American football. It's a good one. <laughs> I don't know anything about American football. <laughs> so, Nate, do you explicitly <laughs> listen to music when you draw? Um, if the dog's running around, I don't have a choice. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I've I've tried listening to podcasts, but again, I'm I'm trying to get better out at being more. Much. Yeah, I'm trying to get better at being more conscious, like more mentally in it when mm. I'm in it, trying to phone it in less. I went through a phase where I just like cranked out work, but it was kind of like meh. So, yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, books, books, and podcasts are kind of out. There are times where mm. I'll just be, you know, work in silence. No, um, dang. If it if it's something I'm like really trying to. Yeah, the sound of silence. That's by Simon Garfunkel. Nah, man, disturbed. (laughs) They did a cover of that. It's so bad. (laughs) Um, but I I I do listen to a lot more soundtracks, or have been listening to a lot more soundtracks recently. Oh, that's Um, tight. There you go. You can find your tones. There you go. Smash pitch to colors. So like condition where you do that. Yeah, it's called uh, synesthesia. Yeah. Uh, my wife actually has some station. She doesn't paint, but she like, it basically is just like the cross wiring where you sort of associate colors with the way you organize things. And so for her, it's like numbers and dates are like, they're the, the, yeah, the neurons or whatever. That's interesting. Or like cross. Yeah. So like twos are blue and like uh, Tuesday is green. It's like Tuesday is green. Like they're the same. They they're like in the same box. And it's so funny because she'll she's met a few other people who have the same thing, and they'll be like, Tuesday is red. And she's like, You're man, you're crazy. Tuesday's green. Like <laughs> they're the same thing. Green and Tuesday, they're the same. It's really, really like funny. Um I want to get a I want to get a, all these people in a room together and just see them yeah. argue about what color the day of the week. The color yeah. Of OCD out of baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I have transitioned, dude, I used to do music, essentially all of it. And I've transitioned into, um, into like mostly books now, probably 75% audio books. And let me tell you, I spent a lot of time in the studio. <laughs> so I spent a lot of time in the books and I am like plowing through stuff. It is, it is not all audio books, obviously, but it is like, I'm, I can't work dude, on background noise like crazy. that. <laughs> like, yeah, I don't. I can. I don't know what it is. I can like, I can do. It, it actually helps me a lot. Helps me like not overthink things. Like if I can sort of turn half my brain. Is off, the I have the opposite actually, problem. I, like my stuff is a lot more technical. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Like if I slip um, up, I have to like figure out how to work it into the rest of the piece. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's interesting, but right now I, you're both doing lines. You both put lines on paper. Don't fight about it. I'm I'm livid. I'm so mad. <laughs> no, um, I'm listening to uh, um, oh, my my. I can't remember the title now. He wanted to say the Grapes of Wrath. I'm not listening to Grapes of Wrath. I'm listening to the Lord of the Flies. Did you guys ever read that in like middle school or whatever? No, no. Okay. It was a uh, mandatory reading for us. I didn't read it. I read you know, little bits and bits here and there. And it's so funny because it popped up the other day and I was like, yeah, I remember like kind of thinking it was interesting when I was like 15. And I'm like plowing through it and it's really interesting. And I, I was laughing. I was telling my wife this week. I was like, you know what? I know I'm getting old because all the stuff that I used to think was like stupid and lame and didn't care about, I'm like, on my own seeking out to educate myself on now. I'm like, oh man, what was that book we were supposed to read in middle school? Like, it's just so interesting and cool and great. I want to listen to it. I was doing that the other day with like history stuff. I was just listening to documentaries about World War II. And I was like, I know I learned this in school and I could not have cared less. Eight. But 
Yeah. Not their name. But I'm listening to doing that too. The, the Gallic invasion of Spain. <laughs> no, I know. Not the Gallic, not the Gallic invasion. The Moors. The Moorish invasion of Spain. Yeah. Yeah. Even there in, there Gaul, even in like in Spain. 20, and, that's, what? This is in like the 13 or 1400s, right after Islam started. Yes. The rise oh, of Islam. Just yes. The Moors just went. Pfft. Yep. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It's just so funny. Even even into college, it's like you could not like, get holy me shit. It. I'm turning into my dad. <laughs> yeah, no, dude, exactly. Right. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, I'm turning into such an old man. Now I'm just reading, you know, before you know it, you're gonna be making model planes out in the back. You're gonna be like, oh, no, 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 no. That's where I don't rock life. music. Yeah. <laughs> your, your pants are all the way up to here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you've got Get your, your members cool. only jacket on. Mm-hmm. 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 Pair of new balances and champion socks. <laughs> you got Hell a yeah. pack because it's just so dang convenient. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'd love to rock a fanny pack. I if I was a wrestler in the nineties, I'd yep, I'd love to go. rock a fanny pack. You move to Austin, you can do it. No one will think you're. No one will think you look weird. People do it all the time here, and I'm like still getting used to it. That dude is wearing a fanny pack, and nobody's laughing. What's going on? I had a dope Chuck E. Cheese one when I was a kid, and I think I got rid of it. Uh, so. Dude, that would be my life's over. That would be primo drift oh. right now. Yeah. Well, cool. Nate, Bill, do you have any do you have any more questions? No, I've I've thoroughly enjoyed myself again this has been with great. Nate Sharmack <laughs> on Frame This Podcast. Yeah. Um, glad you were first. Um, you're not our last. Always a pleasure. Yeah, I thought that's what you were going to say. Glad you're first no. and last. And then you were like, wait, no, nope. that's not true. <laughs> no, nope, not true. Not true. Yeah. Always a pleasure, sir. Um, any parting words for our listeners out there um, in regards to our like, life? coming up that, uh, that you would like people to know about in the exhibit? I know you said you had one in May. Yeah, I have an exhibit in May. So um, really stoked for that. It's going to be really you're cool. You're awesome. Stay tuned on the internet. Yeah, if you're not in Austin, follow me on Instagram. You can find out about it. And um, yeah, parting words. I don't know. I think like... um, What is the biggest thing you've learned throughout this new season of your life? Yeah, I think the biggest thing I've learned is just like... I may have said something to this extent last time, actually. But, you know, play play the long game with things, right? Like, as, as I've gotten older, I've started to realize more and more... It's not that you can plan out you know your life or whatever but um when you're young you put so much like stress on the day-to-day it's right it's like oh man this if i don't like in college everything's broken up into semesters and high school everything's broken up in these little bits right and i think as you get a little older you still think about things in in, like a pretty short-term way and i've started to learn and and i started to learn my career like you know hey you don't have to finish that painting today like you can leave it for tomorrow. You can like close the door and and come back. Come to back, it, you know. Yeah. Um, and actually, maybe if you want to be doing this for a long time, don't burn yourself out. Like it's probably good for you to sleep yeah. <laughs> and go yeah. for a walk, right? Like 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 think about things in in, in sort of the, the sort of long term implications and um, don't get so hung up on like well, you know. <clears throat> Uh, trying to trying to get there, get to your destination, like right now. Um, I think that's the biggest thing I've learned is just like just to slow down and embrace sort of the the long term process and the long game, and take care of myself a little bit better. Um, and I think like I'll reiterate. I know I said this last time, and I'm always saying this: like you got to be your biggest fan. You have to gas yourself up, and you have to believe. Um, no one else is gonna. No one else is going to believe in you if you don't believe in you. You have to, even if you have to fake it, right? You have to, <laughs> you have to fake believing in yourself, and you have to sort of like speak that over yourself and act as if you're going to be successful, um, and really kind of like um, embrace that, and then it'll start catching on. Um, and nobody who's ever been successful has started successful. You know, start in the same place, um, so you just you have to go through all the all the crap to get there, and all the long nights, and all the hours, and all the Am I crazy? Why am I doing this? Is anybody going to like this? Does anybody care? Like you just have to go through that stuff and eventually, you know, if you're going to get there, it's going to be through that. So 
um, you know, play the long game, believe in yourself. Kind of corny, but it's very true. <clears throat> awesome. Well, there you have it. Um, you Nate, it where second. can you find us? <laughs> this is other Nate. Yes. Nate, where can you find us? Nate S. Nate S. Sorry. Well, you're both Nate S. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I thought you were asking me for a second, and I was supposed to be like, dude, I really don't know your, <laughs> your handles like that. <laughs> I was, I'm the wrong guy to ask. <laughs> Not guest. Not guest, yeah. Nate. Hey, host Nate. Host um, Nate. You can find us on Frame This Podcast on Instagram, uh, framethispodcast.com. Our website is a little derelict right now. Um, Still looks great, behind. though. Still looks great. That's the uh, URL, little derelict. I wish. <laughs> it's no, a weird. Well, that's his MC name. <laughs> that's his MC. Yo, MC little derelict. <laughs> little derelict. <laughs> um, yeah, frame this podcast on Instagram and Facebook. Um, and Nate, could you spell your name for us? And, oh yeah, uh, your Instagram handle. Yeah, so it's Nate Sharmack. Um, it's Nate is N A T. Uh, and Sharmak is S Z A R M A C H. And my website and Instagram and all my stuff is just my name, Nate Sharmak. Fortunate. Well, cool. Rock on. Thanks for hanging out. Thanks for spitting words of wisdom for a little over an hour. It's been uh, been awesome. Our first repeat. Hey, first repeat we believe in you. We believe in all our listeners out there. Stay hungry. Stay creative. Let's stay go. Stay safe. Stay safe. Let's go. Love it. Yeah. Have a great day, everybody.